For a long time, Beauregard was accused of throwing away the victory because in the evening, after Johnson's death and Beauregard had assumed command, he did not send forces, forces on Beauregard's far right that would have been the far Union left right next to the river because the point would have been to cut off the Union Army from Pittsburgh Landing and the steamboats and drive it back into a bunch of swamps. But you're of the impression, I gather, that even had Beauregard attempted this, it would have failed because of the situation that uh, had arisen by the time of the early evening. It, the situation was, was this, by the, by the evening, and by that I mean it was getting to be twilight. Um, the Union Army had been pushed back about as far as it could go without going into the river or the swamps. Um, General Buell had arrived on the other side of the river, and of course, uh, if the Confederates could have taken the landing, they'd have prevented him from landing, and uh, simply had Grant to deal with. But by the time all of that occurred, the what was left of the Union Army had drawn itself up uh, like a rattlesnake. Uh, they had. Uh, a number of big siege guns, which are th these guns were, were taller than a man. I mean, they weren't the regular 12-pound Napoleon cannons. Uh, they had been uh, designed uh, to uh, lay siege to Corinth, and they had big, you know, the balls on them were about like this, big exploding balls. And so they loaded these things with, with what amounted to buckshot, you know, grape shot and canister shot, so that they were like a giant shotgun, and they had this just almost hub-to-hub -hub line of artillery that uh, Sherman and some of these other Union commanders had organized, Grant, by that time, those guys who were manning that line, they proved they weren't going to run away. This, this was the best that the Union Army had left. They, they did have a, you know, 10,000 or maybe 15,000 stragglers or deserters down below the bluff, but these guys were going to fight it out. And the Confederates made two charges. They were both unsuccessful. It was just about dark. Uh, Beauregard, the, part of Beauregard's problem was that he was two miles away from this action. He didn't. He, he was at Shallow Church, which is the battlefield is named for a little uh, Methodist chapel called Shallow, which in Hebrew means place of peace of all things. But uh, he, Sherman was. I mean, uh, Beauregard remained back there instead of moving up. He was ill. Um, he, he'd had an operation on his throat, which in those days was a very uh, serious thing. And so he was, they said he had a high temperature, he wasn't feeling well, so you can forgive for that. But he, he thought, look, we got Grant cornered, look what we've done today. We pushed the whole Army, Union Army back, we, we did all the, so on, and captured a whole division. We can finish him off in the morning. I'm gonna order the Confederate Army to pull back to uh, the old Union encampments. And he did, and of course this infuriated uh, General Bragg, General Bo uh, uh, um, Breckinridge, who were there because they thought one more push would do it. My personal opinion is, I walked over, I looked at it, I'd be an awful tough nut to crack. If they had had another couple of divisions there, maybe it would have been possible. But with the men they had on hand, which I, I'm making a guess they had probably five, 6,000 at that point, counting casualties. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if they could have taken that position. They, they, it, it's conceivable they'd taken everything else that day. But uh, it, I, I think that those people who blame Beauregard uh, in saying that he cost us a civil war and all that, that that's a bunch of BS. I mean, he, you know, this guy, he, he, he was fighting as hard as he knew how to fight. He just thought that we could, he could win it the next day. But the interesting thing is that that evening, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, whose name appears uh, much later in the Civil War, well, he was a colonel and he had the cavalry. And he sent a bunch of his people, he collected uh, uniforms from dead Union soldiers and he dressed his soldiers in, in the uniforms of the dead uh, uh, Yankees. And they went down to the river and they saw Buell coming across that evening. And he went back and tried to report it. He couldn't find anybody to try to report it. There was a huge rainstorm, number one. And you have to understand that Shallow is such a dense, dark place anyway. Um, 
with the woods and everything, but he, he found a couple of generals. I think he told General Hardy, who was a corps commander of the Confederates, that Buell was crossing. If you don't stop him now, we're going to lose in the morning. And Hardy, Hardy just said, you go tell Beauregard. Well, he couldn't find Beauregard. And as a result, uh, they woke up in the morning, Beauregard, I mean, Buell was there. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.